On today's show, Ime Odoka walks away with the Coach of the Month award for the Rockets going 13-2 and two in March. Rockets versus Wolves take away some positive and some negative, as well as the importance of the game against the Golden State Warriors beyond just making a push for the NBA play-in tournament. It's all coming up on today's Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day. Thank you for being an everydayer, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for making the show part of your day every single day. A lot to get to in this one. Emu Doko walks away with the Coach of the Month award for the month of March. Rockets going 13 and 2 in NBA best record in the month of March. More on that and what it kind of tells us and what it shows us about what Emu Doko has really accomplished with this team in just a moment. Also want to share some thoughts and takeaways from the Rockets Wolves game the other night. Didn't get a chance to do a full uh recap episode for that one unfortunately uh About midway through the third quarter of that game, I had to uh, take somebody to the ER. Uh, Nothing major, nothing crazy, um, but just had, you know, had some stuff going on personally that night. Uh, Everything's okay now, though. Everything's calmed down. Uh, But yeah, I wanted to at least share a couple thoughts from that game, as well as get into some of the importance and some of the the meaning uh, behind this Rockets-Warriors game beyond just making a push for the play-in tournament. So let's start with Ime Odoka winning coach of the month because first off, I think he absolutely deserved the award Uh, and much like just email Doga staying incredibly on brand uh, didn't want to accept, I guess the credit for winning coach of the month. Like he was appreciative of the honor, but at the same time, one of the first things he said uh, in his pregame presser before the Rockets faced the wolves after the award was announced, he basically said that he was disappointed that Jalen green and Amin Thompson weren't recognized for their play, for their performances as Western Conference Player of the Month for Jalen Green or Rookie of the Month for Amin Thompson. And that's just the kind of coach Ime Doka is, right? He's not going to sit there and, and take all the credit. He's happy to sit there and take the blame when he needs to. Um, and that's what a good leader is like. So I just wanted to point that out really quickly. But it's it's well-deserved for Ime, right? This is a Rockets team that a lot of people, the moment the Alperin Shingun injury happened, a lot of people, myself included, you know, to a degree, right, counted this team out. We thought, hey, all right, you know, you're the guy who's been your best player all season long, he goes down, you've got about a quarter of the season left, you're on the outside looking in from the play-in tournament race, there's not a chance in hell that you're going to be able to pull this off. And Ime said, hold my beer and went on this insane 11 game winning streak that the Rockets had. And obviously the month of March ended on a bit of a sour note with that game against the Dallas Mavericks, Luca going absolutely bananas. And yeah, there were some frustrations, you know, that we had with Ime with the Rockets defensive game plan approach in that one. But that doesn't take away from how good he's been in the month of March. And, and by extension, how good this team has been all season long. Right. I think this I think the month of March is almost like an encapsulation of just what Udoka has worked on with this Rockets team and the fact that this team has embraced his identity, that they've adopted his personality as a group, as as a team on the basketball floor. They're hard nosed, defensive minded, gritty, all of that. But Ime Udoka, I think, is far surpassed any and all expectations that I had for him when he stepped in as the Rockets head coach and probably many expectations that that many fans had for him because I ballparked this team. I think my preseason win total prediction was somewhere in that 35 range. In fact, I think I settled specifically on the number 35, slightly ahead of the Vegas over-under odds, which I think had the Rockets at 31.5 coming into the season. So... I was optimistic even beyond the Vegas odds, well beyond the Vegas odds. And the Rockets are currently sitting even higher than that. Like that's how successful that they've been this season is that the Rockets are even beyond their Vegas 
over under odds, just to double check, just because I want to make sure that I don't forget a number here with the Rockets and their standings, 38 and 37. I wanted to say 38 and 36 for some reason in my head. I was blacking out one of these. I was blacking out the T-Wolves loss. Um, 38 and 37, they're sitting above 500 with a handful of games remaining this season. This season is an absolute win. No matter any way you slice it, no matter what happens with the play-in tournament, this Rockets team has far surpassed every single expectation that they've had this year. And they've did it through a mountain of adversity as well. That's that's the part that I think people really need to consider when you look at what Emi Odoka has done with this team, the success that he's had with this team, the fact that the Rockets' marquee acquisitions this offseason were Dylan Brooks and Fred Van Vliet. Yes, Fred was at one point an all-star in his career, but these are basically, you know, high-end role players. And even then, there have been some distinct stretches this season where Dylan and Fred have struggled and haven't really lived up to their expectations, even though by and large, I do think both of them have far exceeded expectations for them as well uh, as, as the Rockets kind of marquee free agent acquisitions. But by and large, this team is basically the exact same team that the Rockets had last year. It was just internal growth from a lot of the young guys. And Alper and Shingun elevated his play to an all-star caliber level. Um, Jabari Smith Jr., Tari Eason, they elevated their play. And then Jalen Green, who struggled for about two-thirds of the season. Ime Odoka didn't lose sight of the future, right? He didn't lose sight of the vision. He stayed patient with Jalen Green. He stuck by him despite all the struggles. And now we're seeing the benefits of that patient, right? He didn't lose sight of the forest for the trees. And when you consider the fact that they lost Al P with about a quarter of the season left, they lost Cam Whitmore with about the same amount of time left. Uh, obviously Cam Whitmore back in the rotation. Now last game Tari Easton played was all the way back on January 1st. Uh, you lost Fred Van Vliet for a handful of games. You lost Dylan for about 10 or so games. Uh, really the only constant who hasn't missed significant time in the rotation has been Jalen green. Even Jabari's missed some time, right? So, this team has faced a lot of adversity, and despite all of that, Ime Odoka led this team to an above 500 record. They should probably still finish the season with an above 500 record. Knock on wood, trying not trying not to jinx it here on the show. Uh, and in the month of March specifically, I mean, they were dominant. Their numbers were right up there with the Boston Celtics, who are the number one team in the entire NBA this year. They're the buzzsaw that you're going to have to get through if you want to win a title. Uh, Rockets finished in the month of March. They were the NBA's fourth best offense, trailing only the Celtics, Nuggets, and Clippers, all legit contenders. They were the NBA's sixth best defense, uh, trailing the Magic, Knicks, Pelicans, Heat, and Timberwolves. They had the NBA's fourth best overall net rating at 8.4. And they finished with the NBA, NBA's best record at 13-2. and two. That is an insane run in the month of March, and I'm very glad that Ime Odoka was recognized as the coach of the month. Uh, and again, I said this when the hire happened, and I still fully believe this, that Ime Odoka and hiring him may have been the most important move made throughout the entire Rockets rebuild, quote unquote, more important than any draft pick, more important than any season where you tanked, more important than any trade, more important than anything else was getting a top-tier, high-quality head coach in Ime Odoka, a guy that I believe is, is a top-five head coach in the NBA. And he has done so much with this team. And I said it before, and I'll say it one more time. I think Ime Odoka absolutely deserves to be at least a finalist for Coach of the Year. I can't see how he's not a finalist with how incredible this Rockets team has played this year, uh, far surpassing any and all expectations for this season. So I'd like to see him at least finish as a finalist. Uh, maybe that's wishful thinking, but... Coming up, do want to get into some thoughts on the Rockets-Timberwolves matchup. Some good, some bad from that one, as well as the importance of this game against the Golden State Warriors beyond just chasing that final spot in the NBA play-in tournament bracket. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and so much more. Whether in the speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, 
not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. And continuing on here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything. Houston Rockets basketball. Some quick thoughts on the Rockets 113-106 loss against the Minnesota Timberwolves, a game in which the Rockets looked really good early in this game, right? They finished the first quarter leading 23-16. I thought they did a really fantastic job through, honestly, the majority of this game guarding Anthony Edwards, right? They prevented him from having a monster night. He finished the night only 21 points, 5 of 16 shooting, 0 of 6 from downtown. Now, he did get to the free throw line 11 times. He was a lot more active, felt like, in the second half of this game. But where this thing kind of came off the rails and it just felt like the Rockets, even though they kind of made a push and tried to get back into this, the Rockets were leading by 10, 41-31 with like, it was just under six minutes, just under five minutes to go uh, in the first half. And the Wolves went on this insane 23-4 to run to take, <clears throat> pardon me, to take a 54-45 lead into halftime. That, that run was exactly why you saw like you, you saw the best version of the Timberwolves during that run. And it coincided with the Rockets could not buy a basket. They were missing some some hilariously wide open threes. And it felt like the Wolves were hitting absolutely everything. So one team shooting lights out, one team can't hit the broad side of a barn. And that's how you get a 23 to 4 run. And it gave the T-Wolves a nine point edge going into halftime. The Rockets matched them point for point. In that third quarter, 27, 27 all in that third frame. And then it was that fourth quarter where the Rockets kind of made a pseudo push like they were going to try to get back into the game. Um, Fred and Dylan were were, I think, wildly disappointing, uh, at least offensively in this game for the first three quarters. And and Dylan never really had a moment where he like had a resurgence. Um, But Fred showed up in a big way in that fourth quarter and. (coughs) <coughs> pardon me uh <coughs> wow <coughs> great production value here with all the coughing i sincerely apologize um just my asthma kicking my butt all right so in that fourth quarter though it was a little bit too like too little too late right fred had struggled the whole night he kind of showed up there in that fourth quarter he had a couple really big threes followed up you know jeff green hit another big three and the rockets pulled within like three points of the T wolves with a few minutes left to play. Uh, but the T wolves credit to credit to them, right? They executed down the stretch. They were able to pull away. They were able to get some important stops, but what it felt like watching this game, man is, you know, even though Jalen struggled to shoot the ball from outside, just two of 11 shooting, he was 10 of 22 overall. He was four or four at the free throw line finished with 26 points. It, 26 points, five boards, six assists. Uh, it, it really felt like, especially stretches there in that second quarter and in that early third, where Jalen was doing everything he could to attack, collapse the defense, draw the attention of Rudy Gobert, and you know kick it out for wide open shots. And the Rockets just really weren't converting. And it's as simple as that sometimes is if your star player is doing the work that he needs to do and holding up his end of the bargain, then you need your other guys to step up, right? And Fred in that game, four of 13, three point shooting again, he stepped up big in the fourth quarter, but it was kind of too little too late at that point. Dylan Brooks, only one of four, three point shooting Jabari Smith Jr. Two of eight, three point shooting. It just wasn't enough from your starters. And then even more than that, I felt like early on, especially in the first half of this game, Amin Thompson, it feels like he he's being schemed against a lot better by opposing teams now, right? Guarding them or guarding Amin with the opposing center. So Amin being checked by Rudy Gobert really messes with the spacing of everything. And Amin just isn't at a place yet where he feels super, I guess, comfortable or, you know, adept at attacking bigs off the catch or just getting, you know, getting downhill, getting a full head of steam and attacking that way to where he's understanding, okay, if I, if I get a full head of steam, if I drive full force downhill and attack that I can draw free throws or finish through contact, or I can, you know, get to a Euro step and finish around them or whatever. And this was the same kind of, 
I guess, learning experience that Russell Westbrook went through when the Rockets decided to go full-time small ball back at the tail half of the 2019-2020 season where we saw opposing teams guarding Russell Westbrook with their big man. And it took him a little bit of time to adjust and understand, okay, how do I attack these bigs, right? Which of these bigs do I need to like attack and be physical with? Which of these bigs do I need to just use my speed and get around them? How can I attack this defense when they're disrespecting me by guarding me with a big man, by giving me all this space, right? And not settling for three pointers. And it felt like a men was really all kind of discombobulated early in this game. Came out of the half, hit a couple shots, but still not a not a great showing offensively for, you know, three-fifths of the Rocket starters. Really everybody minus Jalen Green. Jabari had an okay-ish game. Um, I liked some of the actions that they ran with Jabari and Jalen specifically, where Jabari was the primary screen setter and would roll into these like little kind of short rolls and then elevate for a jumper or catch the ball, you know, with his defender on his hip in the paint and just be able to, you know, take a dribble or two and then turn and elevate and shoot over them. That's a shot that Jabari, I feel like, can get anytime he wants. So seeing more of that Jabari Jalen two man game was really nice. Now, the two of eight three-point shooting does need to improve because for the five-out offense to work, your five needs to be able to hit your shot. Really, all five guys need to be able to hit their shots for the five-out offense to feel uh, like it's functioning properly. Uh, And you can have the one piece, right, the Amin Thompson piece that isn't, that is, you know, not truly a five out presence, right? He's the, the, the role man. He's your, your vertical presence. He's your screen setter, all that stuff. But I did like how the Rockets were trying to, at least at times drag, uh, drag other guys away from the rim to open things up with Jabari Smith Jr., right? Whether it was Nas Reed or Rudy Gobert on a switch or anything like that, trying to drag those guys away from the rim. But my, the thing that impressed me the most was Jalen's tenacity in not settling for outside shots, right? This is a team with an all-defensive player of the year, multi-time DPOY player in Rudy Gobert, one of the toughest bigs to finish, you know, around the paint against. And Jalen did it multiple times in this game, right? The He had the one early drive where he, he went up, elevated, finished through contact on Gobert, should have been an and one. And then he had the one later in the game that looked like it, like he went up there trying to poster the hell out of Gobert. Like he went up like he wanted to yam at home and still managed to hang and finish like some elite hang time on display from Jalen Green. So yeah, the, the outside shooting wasn't the best in this game, but you subtract the outside shooting. He went 8 of 11 inside the three-point line, right? Including some really tough finishes in and around the rim, right? Still using his speed, using his athleticism, finishing through contact. So despite the outside shooting not really being there for him in this game, he could have probably easily been to the free throw line for an additional, you know, anywhere from four to six different free throws, depending on if the referees had called a few things a little bit differently. Um, And it was just encouraging to see him not settle for just those outside shots. We've seen games before in Jalen's career where he's been hesitant to drive against Rudy Gobert or against a Joel Embiid, against these like elite shot blocking bigs. And in this game, he showed zero fear. He was driving in, he was collapsing the defense, he was finishing through contact, and he was making some really solid reads and kicking it out to his teammates. Guys just weren't delivering when it came to the outside shooting in this game. The Rockets finished shooting just 29.2% from three in this game. The Wolves managed to shoot 42.3% from three in this game. And sometimes it's as simple as that. The Wolves managed to shoot lights out of the ball. The Rockets really struggled to shoot the ball. And that is kind of what it is. But there is one final takeaway that I want to get to about why the Rockets kind of felt like they struggled in this game. And it's an issue we actually saw a little bit earlier this season that's kind of rearing its ugly head yet again. Want to address that as well as the importance of the Warriors game beyond just trying to make the play-in tournament. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. 
Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the NCAA tournament or the NBA postseason right around the corner, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us here at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. And final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. One more point that I wanted to highlight from this, not specifically just this Timberwolves game, although, again, I I thought it was an incredibly encouraging performance from the Rockets against a very, very good opponent in the T-Wolves. And again, sometimes it can just be chalked up to the shooting just wasn't there. But I think it's important to look into why the shooting wasn't there. And I do think this is something that we saw happening earlier this season, pre-All-Star break. But there's something to be said for the wear and tear that a team like the Rockets, a team that prides itself on the defensive schemes of switching a majority, if not all of its actions, um, dealing with mismatches where smaller guys are guarding bigger guys, bigger guys are guarding smaller guys, and the aggressive level of defense that the Rockets have played all season long yeah, the Rockets have been a top 10 defense all year. And yeah, they were the sixth best defense in the month month of March. But that doesn't come without its tolls, right? Playing hard-nosed defense like that is exhausting. The way that the Rockets play defense is exhausting, and it takes a mental and physical toll on the players. And I think we saw exactly that happening just before the All-Star break kicked in, where certain guys, Fred Van Vliet, looked like he had lost a step, right? He looked like, not the same that he did earlier in the in the season. Dylan Brooks looked like he had lost a step, right? He didn't look like he was the same defender, the all-NBA caliber defender that the Rockets went out and signed, the ace defensive wing that the Rockets envisioned that they were getting with Dylan Brooks. And I think we're seeing some of that slippage happen again with this team, where, yeah, they had an incredible month of March, and the record speaks for itself, 13-2, and two, but you're starting to see certain guys, right? Na- namely Dylan and Fred and the level at which they have to output energy and effort on the defensive end, I think is taking a bit of a toll, not only defensively, right? Where we've seen games where Dylan looks not the same, right? Doesn't look like he have the, he has the same tenacity on the defensive end uh, where he hasn't been that, that stalwart defensive stopper that you expect him to be or games where Fred looks like he's struggling. But then on top of that, We've also seen their their shooting kind of regress a little bit, right? Where we've seen some really rough shooting nights from both of those guys as of late. And I do think that it's not just random. I don't think it's just, uh, you know, I don't think it's just a, uh, a shooting slump that directly coincides with both of them. I think it's very clearly the Rockets play a style of basketball that is incredibly aggressive, incredibly demanding, and that style takes its toll on its players, right? The Rockets haven't had a practice since... I want to say middle of March, I think March 17th or March 18th was the last time they had a full-blown practice practice. And I think a big part of that is because this team is probably just a little wiped out, right? From the level at which it's having to play on both sides of the court, right? They have very little margin for error offensively because even though they've been really impressive against certain teams, they still are not a team that can afford to overcome many mistakes. They don't have like an abundance of talent to just overwhelm another team, right? Teams like the Boston Celtics or teams like the Denver Nuggets can go out there and struggle and be bad for like a half. And then they can just turn it on in the next half and outgun an opponent because they have so much talent up and down their roster. The Rockets don't really have that, right? They've got one guy in Jalen Green who is insanely talented and can get hot at a moment's notice. And a couple other guys, right? Dylan can can hit some threes. Fred can start hitting some shots. Cam Whitmore back off the bench. He can get hot. 
but it's not the same as a team that's loaded to the brim with star level players that can just kind of, you know, switch a flip, sorry, flip a switch and, uh, and start cooking at a moment's notice. So it's just something worth monitoring. And I know that, Right, Dylan comes from a Memphis Grizzlies team where he played a, a heavy role, an identical role to what he played with the Rockets, arguably even more involved in the offense over there, much to the chagrin of Grizzlies fans everywhere. Uh, and Fred Van Vliet came from you know a team in Toronto with Nick Nurse, right, where he was you know top five in minutes played every single season. He was constantly you know under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, playing for Nick Nurse, a very another coach who plays a very aggressive style of defensive schemes really not ever taking a single playoff defensively up there in Toronto for years. So, yes, they have experience dealing with it, but it's not to say that they can just do it all the time, right? And so I do think that at least something moving forward for this team when we kind of start looking at some of the moves that they can make this offseason, some of the expectations for this team next year is trying to find ways to minimize the burden on those guys specifically so that they can remain they're be the best version of themselves over longer periods of time, right? They got the rest over the all-star break. They got to recharge their batteries a little bit, came back and they looked like themselves again, but you don't get those big breaks in the middle of the season, right? So I do think it's really important next year and the Rockets are going to be a much deeper team next year, right? Because you're going to have a Min Thompson and Cam Whitmore from the jump. They didn't have those guys from the jump this season, obviously with a Min Thompson's ankle injury early on with Cam Whitmore being, you know, kind of not relegated, but sent down to the Vipers and kind of, you know, slow playing the Cam Whitmore development process. You'll have those two guys early on. You'll have Tari Eason back, and he'll be able to eat up a lot of the wing minutes. You'll have Steven Adams as a big man, so he'll be able to absorb the minutes at the five spot, which currently Jabari Smith Jr. is playing all his, you know, all if not a majority of his minutes at that five spot currently. So there's a lot of different ways in which the veterans, I think, need a little extra rest and not to be, you know, uh, not to be burning burning them out so quickly, right? And we saw this earlier this season with Jeff Green as well. He was another guy that played out of his mind for like the first month and a half of the season. And then because he kind of got thrust into that full-time backup five role because Jock Landale just wasn't didn't have it earlier this year, uh, Jeff Green started to tap out pretty badly where like his three-point shot wasn't there. He looked a little rough around the edges after a really good like month and a half stretch to start the season. Jeff Green started playing some really bad basketball. And so I do think it's something to pay attention to with these vets on this Rockets team. But I want to get to the final point here that I wanted to highlight, which is the importance of this Rockets-Warriors game beyond just the play-in tournament race. Because realistically, look, the Warriors, they've won five games in a row. The Rockets have lost two games in a row. Uh, shout out to the Spurs and Mavericks, who are absolutely useless. Uh, could have used either of those games to keep the the distance a little bit shorter between the Rockets and Warriors currently sitting now. Uh, Rockets three games back of the Warriors. Warriors uh, at 41 and 34. Rockets at 38 and 37. So in all reality, it's looking like a very slim possibility for the Rockets to still make the play-in tournament. That's just... That's just the fact of the matter. The moment the Rockets lost that game against the Mavericks and the and the Warriors won against the Spurs that night and created a two-game separation and then the Rockets lost against the Wolves and the Warriors won against the Mavericks, kind of is what it is. But I think this game matters even more beyond the play-in tournament. It feels like this game is almost, or can be viewed as almost like, I, I think it's kind of like the Rockets championship in a way, where... Yes, the play-in tournament is, is seemingly a little bit out of reach now, but the Warriors still have to win this game. And I think that that pressure is still on them because they're not at a place yet, right? The Rockets aren't eliminated. The Rockets are still very much in the mix for one of those final spots. They have not been eliminated. If they were to win out the schedule from this Warriors game to the very end, they could very realistically still make it. It's, it's a very slim chance, but I think winning this game continues to apply that pressure to Golden State, and I think that in and of itself is a massive win. Even if you don't make the play-in tournament, this is a Warriors team that would love to start resting some of its older players. They've got aging superstars, right? Steph, Clay, Dre. I'm sure that Steve Kerr would love to take a couple games off at the end of the regular season to have the Rockets roll over and die and just get out of their way so that they can focus on their impending match. <clears throat> sorry, their impending matchup with the LA Lakers. 
I'm sure that's exactly what Steve Kerr would want. And I'm sure that's what the Warriors organizationally would want. The Rockets aren't just going to roll over, though. That's not who they are. That's not who they've been this entire season. We thought that the Rockets season was going to be over when Al P got injured. And they have surprised all of us and went on this incredibly magic tear in the month of March to give themselves a shot at the play-in tournament. And I really do think that it's almost kind of validation for their season as a whole, looking at this game, right? It's almost like their championship and going out there and getting a win against still a pretty good Warriors team and pushing them to the limit, right? Pushing them to where they have to continue to fight for their play and livelihood is, I think, an important step for this team to take. It's going to feel like a playoff atmosphere at that game. And it's probably going to be one of the toughest games, if not the toughest game that any of these players on this team, any of the young players, I'll say, because, you know, Fred and Dylan and Jeff have, play, have played, you know, deep postseason runs and on championship teams and whatnot. But it's probably going to be the biggest game in many of these players' careers going against this Warriors team who are still fighting for their lives for the play-in tournament. And while it's, again, while the chances have, have slimmed dramatically, it's still not completely out of the cards. If you win this game, then you're now just two games back of the Warriors and you start looking at the rest of the Warriors' schedule and there's a very realistic possibility that they could drop a, a couple more games. You would need them to drop three of them, but they've got games. They've got another rematch against Dallas. They've got the Lakers. They've got New Orleans. Those are three legitimate playoff teams, legitimate teams that are currently, at least standings-wise, better than the Warriors and teams that all have a vested interest in winning those games, at least as it currently stands. Because when you look at the standings, the Lakers are currently vying for potentially making it out of that nine seed bracket and overtaking the Sacramento Kings. The New Orleans Pelicans are fighting in that little, really that whole five to like nine range is all super jumbled to where all the way from the Mavericks at five, then Suns at six, Pelicans at seven, Kings at eight, and Lakers at nine. All five of those teams all have legitimate reasoning to want to finish out the schedule strong because they just don't have the buffer around them to guarantee that they're in their spot. They, they don't have any of those spots sewn up, locked in, whatever. And the benefit for the Rockets is it's looking more and more increasingly likely that the LA Clippers will have that fourth seed all sewn up. And if the, if the Clippers have that fourth seed all sewn up, then that means that the Rockets will have hopefully a game at the very end of the season. The final game of the season for the Rockets on the road against the Clippers should be a rest game for LA. So you start looking at that re at the rest of the schedule and yeah, the Rockets still have some really tough opponents coming up. They've got the Miami heat. They've got on the road against Dallas and they've got at home against the Orlando magic, but it's a, it's going to be a gauntlet, but I'm going to say never say never, right? You win this game. You're still very much in the play in tournament race. You lose this game. You're effectively, I think basically shut out, right? Because you would have to finish with a better record than the Warriors. And while that's, on the table still if they win the game, it's not going to be on the table if you lose this game because at that point there's just too much separation between the two teams. And again, I think even besides just the play-in tournament race, the importance of this game for advertising what this young team has done, how they've grown this season, where they were to start the year and where they are to finish this year, I think it speaks volumes about what Ime Odoka has been able to accomplish with this team. So I just want to see a good, hard-fought, competitive game and... Again, I think that winning this game, putting all that pressure on the Warriors, I think it's going to go a long way for looking at this team in the offseason, remembering what this team was able to achieve, and you don't want to go out on a sour note, right? Like, obviously, the last two losses have been kind of rough. You don't want to flame out and, and you know, finish on a losing streak where you lose to the Warriors, then the Heat, then the Magic, and, and have this, you know, kind of tailspin as the season winds down, because then it, it would almost kind of erase the success of the month of March, right? So I think picking up a big win, a statement win against the Warriors, keeping the pressure on them in the play-in tournament race, even if you don't make it, is really important for this young Rockets team. So with that, very excited for this Rockets-Warriors game. It's going to be a big one. Can't wait to see the Rockets take on Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors. 
Uh, with that, that's going to do it for today's show. As always, thank you so much for checking things out. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available wherever you listen to your pods, including YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you're listening via Apple Podcasts, five-star review helps us out tremendously. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Thank you.